But our focus will also be on a very exciting case that I'm sure you've heard about. It is out of Kentucky, and it is the Shana Hubers case. We sent our man Aaron Keller down there last week, and now we are still following this case, and that's where I want to begin today. Shayna Hubers is on trial for the murder of her boyfriend, Ryan Poston. She shot him six times, including once in the face, claiming self-defense that Ryan was trying to attack her that night. But evidence from the crime scene and her own words, both before the shooting and after the shooting, would suggest to prosecutors that this was a cold-blooded murder. And that's where I want to start. Shayna Hubers provided an interview to police, and her words, let's just say, did not help her case so much. Take a look. It was painful to watch him die and to know that I had done that. Then I just walked around the table and shot him where I knew he would die immediately. And fast. His obsession with guns killed him. That interrogation tape did not do her any favors, but that's my opinion. Let's ask the opinion of someone who really matters, long crime trial analyst Yosha Gudisakera. Yosha, good morning to you. Good morning. So when you look at this interrogation tape from the perspective of a lawyer, she's going into her retrial, what do you think? It's not great. There's a reason why us defense attorneys tell our clients you have the right to remain silent and you should exercise that right. That is exactly what Shayna should have done here, and it's not helping her case at all. Why did she not lawyer up at that point? Why was she so forthcoming in her 911 call to explain that this was self-defense? Why was she giving these details to this officer? Help explain it to me. I don't think we'll ever know what's going on in her head, and I think a good defense attorney who's representing her is going to say she was extremely emotionally disturbed. She was just attacked by her boyfriend. Something terrible happened, and she just wasn't thinking straight. So the defense is going to try to have to play this into their narrative, but of course it's going to be an uphill battle. I agree with you. And you know what I want to do right now? I want to play the testimony from the officer who spoke with Shana. This is Officer Amber Ensweiler, and she's from the Northern Kentucky University Police. Imagine being the officer that is interviewing Shana Hubers. Well, let's see what happened. Take a look. She mentioned something about, is he dead? And did you see the white sheet over him? But I don't remember exactly what she said about it. Did she say anything specifically about where the shots were fired? Yes, she said she thought she shot him in the face and in the chest, but she didn't remember which one was first. What else did she say about the locations where she believed she shot him? Um, she had made a comment about shooting him in the nose. Um, and I think this was on the recording as well, but she gave him the nose shot that he always wanted. You had mentioned um, she said something about emotional abuse during this period of time before you get into the recording room. Did she say anything to you about physical abuse? No. Um, during that period of time that you were with her, how would you describe her talking? Um, it was not very cohesive. Um, it was bits and pieces of a conversation. She went from talking about um, talking to her mother and then um, back to shooting Ryan um, and then we saw her on the video, um, and she talked a lot. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Was that the same thing 
Yes. Prior to? Yes, that's okay. correct. So during this period of time when you don't have a recording to go back on, this is this is based upon your memory. Those are the types of things that you remember <laughs> that she mentioned giving him the nose job? Yes. Even prior to it being said on the recording? Correct. Just please clean it up. But objection sustained. Go ahead. You remember her making that comment to you more than once, is that correct? That's correct. Um, you remember her um, emotional abuse, and you remember nothing about physical abuse. Objection, ask and answer. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Is that what you remember? That's correct. Okay. Anything that you remember as it relates to Mr. Poston and guns? That he was a gun freak, I think is what she called it. Mm -hmm. A gun freak or a gun fanatic, I can't remember what the terminology was. Um, but that it was funny that the guns he loved so much killed him. It was funny. Um, at this point, Your Honor, I don't have any. There's always so much to talk about in this case, which I'm happy to do because there's, I have Yosha here to talk more about this. The prosecution is presenting a very strong case. Let's not forget they first secured a conviction in her first trial. The only reason she's getting a second trial is because one of the jurors on that first jury was a convicted felon and didn't uh, put that on the jury questionnaire. What does the defense realistically have to do to win the case here? I think the defense has a very uphill battle. You're right. The prosecution has already secured a conviction. Of course, it was overturned. But here, they're bringing in a new element, that sexual element um, that not only is going to grab the jurors, but is also going to, it's going to give a motive for why Shayna did this, that she was sexually abused, she was verbally abused by this man, and she did what she had to do in this situation. So they're bringing in new motive, which I think potentially could be significant. Is that a legitimate defense, though? I mean, if you if you kill someone and you are not in imminent danger, but yes, it was built up of a, a bad relationship, and let's say he was the worst boyfriend on earth, that doesn't excuse a killing. So they're going to have to argue that it was imminent danger, and what they're doing is they're giving background. They're giving context for this relationship. She didn't shoot him out of the blue. This was building for a long time, and then what we saw that night, that was the boiling point. But what in the crime scene would indicate there's a struggle? Because if you look at the evidence, there was there was nothing turned over. Like uh, she said, she was thrown around the apartment. Um, we believe that he was shot while he was sitting, not at a standing location. She shot him from a downward angle, which would indicate that uh, well, he was already on the ground. So what, in your opinion, can she formulate and say there was a struggle? Is it the idea that the gun was out to begin with? Well, there's two sides to every story, right? You're looking at it, how the prosecution is presenting it, but the defense and any good defense attorney is going to put on their own experts and dispute some of the facts that are there. They're going to say they're not facts at all. He wasn't sitting down, for example. They're likely going to dispute that with their own set of experts. I know we only have 30 seconds. Real quick, I know this case is this trial is different than the first trial. Will she take the stand? I don't think so. I don't think it's a good idea, and I think that she would put the nail in her own coffin if she did so. Look at that. Look at that. That was a nice little uh, oh. fun you did there. All right, here's what we're going to do. When we come back, we're going to talk more about Shana Hubers, but we are also going to talk about the Roy Oliver case, about that officer who gunned down a young 15-year-old man named Jordan Edwards, and we're going to try to understand why this happened. But I will also let you know that when we come back, we have an update in the Molly Tibbetts case, the missing University of Iowa student. We will let you know what is happening when we come back, so you don't want to miss anything. We'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to switch gears on our uh, side here. We're going to focus on a major case, another major case, here on the new, here on Law and Crime, and that has been the Shana Huber's case out of Kentucky. Again, this young woman who is on trial for the murder of Ryan Poston, her boyfriend. They, the defense is painting a very horrible relationship that ended in tragedy. Well, the prosecution is saying, you see this woman right here? She is a cold-blooded murderer, and she should not be trusted for anything that she said. What I want to do right now is play you the testimony of Doris West. This is a neighbor of Ryan Poston, and she is going to talk about what she saw and what she heard the night that Ryan got shot in his condominium. Take a look. What happened next? Let me see. Uh, 
case and I want to talk to Yosha Gunasekara a little bit more about it because the details of it are pretty incredible. Why did the defense switch strategies here? The first trial we didn't hear so much about their sexual relationship. We didn't even know that she was sexually abused according to her defense attorney. Why switch strategies right now? Well, they lost the first trial. So that's probably that's the biggest indicator that they're not going to sway a jury with what they did before. They needed to provide something more because, again, this is a really tough case. I mean, we just heard the neighbors say there was no struggle, and that's at the heart of the defense's theory. So they're really trying to shore that up by talking about this couple's past. If she is psychologically damaged, if she was a ticking time bomb, if her, the, the wires were not connecting the same way as you and me, is that a more of a defense? And is that an avenue that the defense should have explored? I don't know if that's insanity, but something like that? I think they probably should have gone that way. I think it's very clear that the prosecution is proving this isn't self-defense. I think if they had just said she was emotionally disturbed, she had some other 
um, issues, I think they would have had a stronger case. Well, we're going to talk more about this and what the definition of extreme emotional disturbance is, uh, according to the statute. But I also want to let our viewers know that we were just talking about the Molly Tibbetts case. There is a press conference scheduled for 5 p.m. Central Time today. We will, we will talk more about that. I'm sure a significant amount of information will be shared. Uh, so we're covering a lot here on Law and Crime. We have to take a quick break on our end. But when we come back, we'll talk about everything. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. We are talking about a lot here on Law and Crime, but we want to focus right now on the Shana Huber's case because this is a truly bizarre case out of Kentucky about a woman who is, you see her right there, that she's facing a retrial. She was first tried and convicted for the murder of her boyfriend, Ryan Poston, but she's getting a second trial after one of the jurors in that jury we found out was a convicted felon and didn't mention that on the jury questionnaire. That was a mistrial. She's getting a second shot at the apple right here. But unfortunately, the prosecution is presenting a very strong case against her that this was a cold-blooded murder, while she is claiming that it was self-defense. The evidence, though, doesn't quite seem to support that theory. But she, her defense team has also seemed to put out this idea that she was in a horrible relationship with Ryan Poston, that he wanted to be with other women, that he was going to break up with her, that he was emotionally and sexually abusive towards her, and that she was a ticking time bomb. What I want to play for you right now is the testimony of Vernon West. This is another neighbor who was there the night that Ryan Poston was shot. I believe Vernon is the husband of Doris West, who we just played you a little while ago. Let's hear from Vernon what he saw and what he heard the night Ryan was shot. A prior tenant that lived in that apartment above you after Mr. Poston, do you recall ever hearing some arguments between he and a significant other? That's, I heard it once, he was fighting with his girlfriend, and I called the police. And that's a neighbor who lived there after Mr. Post? Yeah, yeah. And you could hear that fighting? Oh, I can hear that one, because he, yeah. Okay. And um, Mr. West, I want to direct your attention. There was a prior hearing in this case where you came and gave testimony, correct? Yeah. And I want to approach and remind you of something. Um, at, under your prior sworn testimony, when asked if you heard anything prior to the shooting and returning home from Newport, you had told them that you thought you heard Miss Hubers sitting on the deck sobbing a little bit, and after a while I guess she went inside, and it wasn't long until I heard gunfire. Does that help you recall testifying to that at a prior hearing? I, I don't know if I heard her that night. No, okay, you're not sure as you sit here? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, the night before, Go on. she was out sobbing on her. So that would have been Thursday night, October 11th? Yes, on the deck. And you heard her crying on the deck? Yes. Okay, did you hear anything else? Well, and I and I heard Ryan come out and, and tell her, you know, it's okay, it's okay. All right. And then and that's, I, I don't remember Friday night Okay. So as, as you sit here today, you don't recall hearing her cry that Friday night? No, I don't, I don't think I do. Okay. Um, but you do recall giving prior sworn testimony at a hearing in this case? Yes. Okay. Pretty incredible stuff, trying to understand what happened in that condominium. I'm sure a difficulty, Yosha, is the fact that the only two people who really know what ha knew what happened in that condominium were the victim and the defendant. So how do you defend a case like that when it's her word against what really ha what the evidence suggests? Well, it's actually a pretty common scenario. So this is why these witnesses are very important. They weren't there, but they clearly were able to hear a fair amount. So that's important. But then also recreating the crime scene. This is when forensic analysis is very important to determine where he was standing, where she was standing, how close the gun was to him. Those are the important things that are needed in order to really recreate this crime scene that none of us were able to see. Yeah, and she, her own statements, you got to look at those statements. She wanted to kill him about a week, week and a half before the actual shooting. How do you ward that off? How do you ward the, the text messages where she said she hoped her friend, who's a dentist, would mess his teeth up so he's so ugly that no other woman will want him? 
It's difficult. She obviously had a lot of rage towards him. And what the defense has to play at here is we've all been angry at people and we've all said things that we regret. Of course, not everyone has then gone on to kill the person that they were angry at, but they have to, again, always bring it back to the self-defense. She did say that he was throwing her around immediately after this happened. That is something that is consistent and something that they can point to to shore up their self-defense theory. She had no injuries on her, though, in the, when they, she took the mud shot, and there was nothing disturbed in the condominium. Can you still have say that he threw her around? It's difficult. It becomes a very uphill battle, which then begs the question, why did they decide to go with self-defense? Uh, it's a good question. It is a good question, and we will follow that a little bit more. But I want to talk about another huge case in the media right now. I'm sure you've heard about it. It is the case about Christopher Lee Watts. This is out of Colorado. This man, um, he is somebody, you've seen him probably, he has said that he, ha his, he wanted the safe return of his wife and children. They went missing, but what happened? He was just charged with their murder. He claimed that he has he had confessed to killing his wife in a fit of rage after he saw her killing their two young daughters, and his wife was pregnant at the time. This is a truly horrific case, and the details of it are bizarre. I want to try to understand how this is being investigated a little bit more from our very special guest, former police officer Charlie Wilkie. Charlie, this case is really strange. You're first having a missing, per missing persons case then you were going into a murder case with the very father. I mean, how did this all unfold? Do we do? How does it work in terms of you? Ha I'm sure they looked at the father first, right? He's the first suspect. Absolutely. He's going to be the first suspect. Any close family members, if there's an alleged boyfriend, any other acquaintances, those kind of things are always going to be the first people that are looked at. And and, and you're also going to look at their temperament, their uh, demeanor, how they're handling themselves through this time. Are they acting like a spouse would if their if their uh, wife and, and two daughters were missing? Uh, those type of things go play into that as well. Police said that Watts told them that he buried his wife on the property of the oil and natural gas company that he worked for, and that he dumped the girls inside the oil tanks. How do they go about finding the bodies? Wow, it, it's 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 going to be a process, and and I, I don't know if they're going to have to drain the tanks and and how much uh, decomposition is going to be either saved or or. or happened while it's inside while they were in the oil. It's just a horrific way for those poor children's lives to come to an end. I, I agree with you. And do you go searching for their financial records, try to make sense of why this might have happened? I know that they it's claimed that they were in significant death debt, excuse me, but what do you do to investigate the motive? Right, exactly. You look at all that, you look at the financial aspects, you're gonna be checking uh, his phone for any any records. What is there another woman involved? Um, you know, is he is he made her promises that he's gonna leave the wife and children and move on? But he's got another baby on the way. So if they're uh, financially strapped, you know, you don't know what kind of pressure he thought he was under that he that he felt like he needed some kind of permanent uh, solution to a temporary problem because they're all temporary problems. You know, we've all been through times that you know tough times and you work through them and you continue moving forward. Uh, this is never the answer. You know. Reports are that he was having an affair with somebody and that he was planning on leaving the wife, but I want to see how this all plays in with Yosha. Yosha, the idea that uh, he claims he killed his wife because she was killing the children, have you ever seen that be a successful defense before? I don't think I've even ever heard of it before. It just sounds like someone who is caught red-handed doing something bad and then is blaming someone who can't speak for herself because she's dead. It just, the whole... The whole chain of events were very bizarre because he at first acted like they were just missing. So he's been very inconsistent in what he's been saying, which I think raises a lot of red flags. And Charlie, how do you even go about investigating that claim that she was killing the kids? What would you look for? Well, you'd look to see, you know, where is he claiming this happened at? Is there any physical evidence at that scene or is there even a scene there? Uh, all those different things uh, as far as what his testimony is going to be versus the physical evidence is, is just the basis of, of how that's all going to get started and how it's going to play itself out.
Wow, wow. I, 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 every time I look at the picture of the family, looks like an idyllic family, looks like a great family, picture perfect, and there was a lot hidden underneath there. We're going to have to find out more about it. We will update all of our viewers about this Colorado father, and uh, as you know, it's been constantly in the news, but stick here on Law and Crime because we cover it from a different angle. And when we come back, we're going to talk about our other case here, and that is the Roy Oliver case. Why did 15-year-old Jordan Edwards get gunned down? We'll find out.